Hello, I'm Myrna Roberts, and I'm happy you're joining me in this discussion on advanced communication theory. The purpose of this level of inquiry is threefold. First is to add to the body of knowledge. Secondly, to inform policy. And third, to improve practice. But put in practical terms, I want to solve complex cultural and intercultural issues. Essentially, it means that a scholar can use these kinds of theories to critically deconstruct and interpret a problem qualitatively and or objectively analyze and inform your study empirically using quantitative methods. Using the methods below will go a long way in doing and helping you to do modern problem solving. But these are only examples. There are many theories available to draw from. If you're doing this for fun, then just sit back and listen. But if you're in graduate school and, and the facts are important to you, this is an appropriate time to get out your note cards and write down some of these authorities for the, found, for the foundational information of this lecture series. Uh, so the first thing that we'll do is the description of, I'll give you a description of dominant communication theories. To properly understand communication theory, you should know that there are two differing perspectives. There's an objective perspective and an interpretive perspective. Objectivity refers to empirical data that will probably involve statistical information. Communication scholars who have this perspective sometimes refer to themselves as behavioral scientists. The interpretive perspective refers to deconstruction and interpretation of social orders and disorders. The interpretive perspective includes rhetorical, critical, and deconstructionist scholars. To show how the two perspectives operate, I'll give you two theories that help shape the field of communication. One objective and one interpretive. First off, the mathematical theory of communication reigning from the objective perspective, and secondly, the social constructionist theory and interpretive perspective. And I'm, I'm giving you two that I use. These are two differing forms of theories, perspectives that I personally use as my foundations. So the first is Shannon and Weaver's 1949 Mathematical Theory of Communication. And it's a good place to start a discussion over the origin of communications, behavioral scientific community. The theory sparked empirical study of communication with the construction of a simple linear model. The mathematical theory of communication originated when Claude Shannon who was the inventor of the binary digital logic, was employed as a mathematical engineer at Bell Telephone Laborator Laboratories. Shannon, in 1948, theorized that uh, what he theorized what would later be coined as the Magna Carta of the Information Age by Scientific American Academic Journal. Shannon's initial theory was invented primarily to guide telephone engineers in their efforts to create efficient ways of transmitting electrical signals. When Warren Weaver applied the technical theory to interpersonal communication, an effective model of communication was recognized. Together, the two men established the linear elements of communication as Number one, an information source. That's the message producer. Number two, the transmitter. The transmitter encodes the message into a signal. Number three, the channel. 
the channel adopts the signal for transmission for the receiver and the receiver decodes the message uh, decodes the signal back into a message number five destination that's the message's final stop I have as number six noise Noise is a dysfunctional factor that includes any interference with the source's original message. Examples of noise can be screaming, loud music, static on the line, or an uncomfortable chair during a lecture. That's why I told you to sit back and relax. Shannon and Weaver identified three hierarchical levels of problems with corresponding questions. So, the first problem was a technical problem. And that question is, how accurately uh, can communication symbols be transmitted? The second one is a semantical problem. How accurately do the symbols convey the intended message? And number three, effectiveness problem. How accurately does the received message uh, does the received message affect the conduct of the receiver? So that means you heard what I said. Are you reacting differently? Are you doing? Are you reacting to what I said? The mathematical theory of communication was criticized because the model identified the source as a central decision maker and lacked cybernetic demands for feedback. Nevertheless, one can easily see this still. This is very, these are very important questions and the model locks in place fundamental phases of communication. The other basic concepts of the theory question redundancy and entropy. Uh, essentially, it means that when redundancy is high, understanding is also high. But entropy, which is uh, entropy in the quality and quantity of the information transmitted, is low. So this means that the more the message is repeated, the more the message is understood. And you lose very little of your message. On the other hand, when redundancy is low, entropy is high. Large portions of the message are lost in the transmission. So when entropy is high, I mean, so when redundancy is low, so you're not repeating the message, then you lose a lot. The mathematical theory of communication proved vital for communication engineers in one, the capacity of bits per second, two, it contributed largely to computer science in many ways, three, it led to technical improvements in message transmission, and number four, it stimulated scholars from other disciplines to scientifically study communication. So now for the interpretive perspective. In 1966, Peter L. Berger and Thomas Luckman published The Social Construction of Reality. The text was listed as the fifth most important sociological book of the 20th century by International Sociological Association in 1998. Berger and Luckman introduced the term social construction into social science to describe how human reality is socially constructed, meaning that conversations, an inevitable part of human interaction, are the building blocks of society. Conversations continuously shape individual and collective identities, identities and holistically influence every juncture of life. Restated, Continuous interactions between people in social systems develop and shape the oppressive mental images. Oppressive. Humans judge each other. So they develop and shape oppressive mental images humans maintain about each other's activities. 
The book, Social Construction of Reality, connects the dots this way. I don't know everything known to my fellow person or my fellow man. And they don't know everything known to me. So therefore, uh, extremely complex and hidden systems of expertise are developed. Ideas about the work and activities of others eventually become habits and habituated into mutually shared roles. These roles are, are played by characters. And the characters relating to each other, when these roles are accessible for other, char other characters to enter the role play. So, for example, if I work at a job, when I leave, someone else will come and fulfill my role. End of story. So, when these roles are accessible for other characters to enter the role play, the reciprocating interactions, talking to each other, crystallize into what we call institutions. Institutional channels dispense new reality, all revolving around conversations, casual conversations, professional conversations, formal conversations, or informal. The process of institutionalization weaves meaning and belief into the fabric of society. The meanings and beliefs are what we determine to be knowledge. Reality is therefore said to be socially constructed, and knowledge is established through reality. Look at there. So the social construction of reality sets the stage for social deconstruction by explaining that the building blocks of all societies, collective reality, are socially constructed to the advantage of the group in power. That societies are created for an affluent group over and above the reality of all others. So embedded within the social construction, social constructionist theory is a basic idea that people are marginalized objects. Their bodies or organisms to be, to be detained and regulated by the affluent institutional power apparatus, denying all others voice in their own livelihood and social status. Therefore, institutions are sources of demeaning national symbols, myths, and metaphors that society is used to significantly differentiate between objects to elevate the affluent. The social constructionist theory examines situations that lead to manipulation on every level uh, by the dominant classes, political interest groups. Social constructionist theory provides a remarkable template for predicting the behavior of human institutions and their sub-organisms. I use Shannon and Weaver and Berger and Luckman to set the stage for a sense of order. Two separate veins of communication theory, interpretive, deconstructive, and objective behavioral scientists. The behavioral scientists will use quantitative methods to obtain data, while the deconstructionist, who is no less rigorous than the behavioral scientist, will use several other kinds of methods. I hope you'll join me in the second video of this series of advanced communication theory.